You're listening to Economics Detective Radio. My guest today is Frank Milne of Queen's University. Frank, welcome to Economics Detective Radio. Thank you. Pleasure to be here. So our topic for today is unintended consequences. Frank has written a paper directed at policymakers to help them understand some of the pitfalls that economists have identified. The paper is directed at Australian policymakers, so some of the examples are Australia-specific, though they generalize quite well to other countries. He goes through a number of specific examples, some of which we'll discuss here today. So... Frank, let's start where the paper starts. You start out by discussing Australia's heavy investment in mining and commodity exports to China in the wake of the 2008 crisis. Can you describe how that situation came about and and how it turned out? Yeah, you have to go back historically to to get some perspective. You'll find that uh, Australia had a, a big mineral boom, particularly iron ore, in the 1960s. Prior to that, the people had thought that there wasn't not, not a lot of uh, iron ore in Australia, but they discovered huge quantities in Western Australia, and they began exporting to countries like Japan. There was an expansion of capacity, and then there was a downturn. There was turmoil in the seventies and so on, and so that that petered out. It took up picked up again in the eighties, again exporting to Japan, and then there was a bust. These are these are cyclical industries. It's well known in the uh, mining industry. You get these kind of cycles. People get very enthusiastic, high prices. There's a big expansion in capacity. Sometimes the capacity outruns the demand or the demand slackens off. Japan got into trouble in the late 80s and in the 90s. It stagnated. So that, that created huge problems. Then it picked up again in the, it would be in the late 90s through the 2000s with China, massive exports to China and was ramping up with the infrastructure, uh, exporting coal as well. From Australia and always also liquefied natural gas. In uh, 2007, eight period, Japan found a lot of its exports falling off to uh, the United States with the downturn and also to Europe. And so uh, you've seen a dramatic fall in commodity prices, but it was temporary because China, China basically increased its infrastructure expenditures like a huge Keynesian expansion infrastructure. And the prices skyrocketed again, and Australia kept expanding its capacity, particularly in iron ore. I was warning at the time, and others were warning, that this wouldn't continue because China's economy was becoming unbalanced. And so, therefore, you find 2012, 13, you see the commodity prices, iron ore starts to really go down. And you find that some of the companies that got in, the smaller ones, uh, started to have trouble. You find that in Western Australia, the housing market went down, there was unemployment. So this was actually fairly predictable. The timing is always difficult, but if you were lending into that uh, market, you should be doing the downside on that market to see where the losses are. Yeah. So the analogy to you know a single person might be if you get a one-time windfall, you, or you need to recognize the difference between a, a permanent increase in in your income or you know the income for once your job or a specific activity and a one time windfall and you don't want to you know say take out a mortgage on the basis of money you found on the lying on the street or and you don't want to yeah. change your career because one uh because there's a sudden one time demand for for a particular skill set and similarly on on a larger level this was, it seems like people thought that this was more permanent than it was and over-invested. Yeah. Yeah. And in fact, the, the thing is that these, um, the, the other example is the oil industry. You find it in Texas, you find it in Alberta, and you see these cycles. And I think the Canadian banks have been fairly shrewd uh, in understanding the cycle. So they've always been careful in terms of their lending, not just on directly to oil companies, drilling companies, and so on, but also into real estate. So this sort of cycle is, is pretty well understood. The people who get caught, the people who come in and don't understand the cycle, and they start lending. A good example would be Texas in the 1980s. It was the OPEC oil boom. The price went up. A lot of expansion of drilling was very extensive. And, of course, in the United States, there's a lot of small banks, and there was an entry of a lot of small banks 
and they were surprised when the oil price went collapsed and then real estate, unemployment, the FDIC, Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation in the United States, they ended up resolving something like 350 banks in Texas. It was a disaster. There were problems also in Alberta in the 80s for precisely the same reason. So these type of commodity cycles quite well known to sophisticated lenders and banks. Right. So so there's sort of a a greater fool problem happening here that people can just enter and have short-term gains on the on the basis of making essentially mistakes is, is that will be definitely will fail the next time, you know, the cycle comes, but in the meantime can can look very lucrative. Yeah. 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 So, I, I it also close. Yeah, go on. Oh, I was I was just going to mention you, you mentioned all the small banks in the United States whereas Canada has a smaller number of of larger and better diversified banks. Is is the is the problem less uh less bad in Canada because because of this uh oligopolistic banking system? Uh that's an interesting question. I mean, Australia's got a similar system. It has uh four big banks. And then you've got some smaller regional ones, much smaller. Canada's got the same. I mean, there are smaller fringe out there as well. You know, got various cooperatives and so on. You've got to remember, of course, so the regulators play an important role. The regulation has become much more sophisticated in the last 20, 30 years. So they're, they really monitor the banks very closely. So for example, OSFI, the Canadian bank regulator, has people inside each of the banks. And they can ask for virtually any information. So they can actually compare the banks. They stress test the banks on a downside. They do it, you know, they do it systematically. The banks themselves run stress tests internally. And I run a program that, that a graduate program that looks at this type of material here at Queens. And, uh, so what happens is that they, the banks have got more sophisticated themselves. Regulators have got more sophisticated and internationally. So you have uh, international regulations being introduced. You find it in the United States. You'll find now that they have widespread stress, stress tests being done in all the major financial institutions in the United States. The smaller banks, the stress tests are much simpler. They're smaller institutions. The big banks are more complicated because they have different markets. They have the wholesale market, retail market, mortgages, you know, car loans, some securitization on credit cards and so on. So it's quite a complicated situation and you have to understand where the risks are, the underlying risks are, and how that tracks through because you can find with securitization that what you're doing is you, ideally, it, it works quite well in that you would spread the risk, a bit like a insurance reinsurance market in the insurance uh, industry where you're spreading the risks around so that when there's a loss, where there are losses, everybody takes a bit of a haircut and it's not so, it's not concentrated. So that, that was the idea of securitization. Quite a sensible, if it's operated properly, it's quite a sensible scheme. But if it's mishandled, it can be, you know, like anything else, it can be abused. Yeah. So, I mean, your, your paper discusses housing in, in both the U.S. and Australian context, and we just discussed it a little in, in the Canadian context. H- how have rising housing prices and then the uh, the 2006, 7, 8 fall in, in those prices, at least in the United States, h- how does that relate to unintended policy consequences? Okay. Okay, so I'll talk about the U.S. and I'll talk about Canada and Australia. I'll talk about the U.S. first. Actually, I'll talk about some other countries in between. I'll talk about Ireland, for example, a good example. Mm. I think one of the problems in the U.S. was that uh, government policy was to induce, you can see this in the, in the policies, of trying to induce people to buy houses and, you know, borrow extensively. You had Fannie and Freddie and various things, organizations to encourage that. The real danger with that is that you see your underwriting standards start to go down. Now, some originators of mortgages uh, were very, very bad in the sense that they lowered the underwriting standards of originating mortgages much more than others. So there's been recent research on this, looking into this, so that you find that there's a big run up in house price, not generally, but in certain areas. And it's quite, it's quite distinct 
there were parts of California with big run-ups in, in housing prices, and some and Florida, for example, some others, and some other areas where there wasn't much run-up at all. So what you find is that government policies, and particularly also, it's a barrage of things. You had low, int very low interest rates after September the 11th, and then they started to increase them around about 2006. You can see the interest rates, late 2005, you see the interest rates start to ratchet up. And that starts to put some stress on the mortgage market. Then people start to worry about defaults. Uh, the losses start to appear. They tend to be, unfortunately, some of them have got concentrated. I won't go through the, the full mechanism of what happened with securitization, but, and then people got frightened. And so what you get is a liquidity event where the shadow banks were effectively lending long and borrowing short. Okay. And there's a maturity mismatch. And what happens is in traditionally in banking, if you think of a simple example, banks would have depositors. They would lend long and you could have a bank run. That's well known banking theory we've known about for a long time. Deposit insurance insures the depositors. And so depositors don't run normally with their under the limit. Uh, they don't run. But the banks also and now increasingly borrow wholesale. So, and of course, there's no deposit insurance on that. And certainly not with the shadow banks. So the problem is you effectively had a run. Uh, a good example of that would be Northern Rock in England. And they had a run. It was largely a wholesale market run. There was also depositors started to run, but it was the wholesale where they got into trouble. Another area, country which got itself into deep trouble was Ireland. It had a big run up in housing prices and that collapsed. Partly, I think, due to observing what was going on in the United States. And then people looked at Ireland people externally and said, hang on a minute. These guys look like they've got, you know, incredibly high housing prices. And then the whole thing unwound very rapidly. So that's another example. Historically, we've seen examples of this in Sweden in the early 90s, big run up in real estate, commercial real estate. It collapsed, taking the banks became insolvent. Most of them, I, I'm, I'll be being a bit rough here, but uh, essentially the, the Swedish government effectively nationalized nearly all of them and then resold them after about four or five years of uh, resolution. Coming up to the current time, in housing, Canadians are well aware of the house price, uh, in big increases in Vancouver and Toronto in certain areas. You've got exactly the same thing taking place in Melbourne, Sydney, and Auckland. There are other areas, but I'll just concentrate on those. They seem to be very similar. So what happens is that certainly in Canada, but also in Australia and, and New Zealand, there's a very significant immigration. In Australia, immigration, concentrate in Australia for the moment as an example, they, the government allowed a much a big increase in immigration. It shot up from about, this is about 2007, eight, shot up from about 100,000 a year or a bit under to over 200,000 and it stayed up there. So you find that the population growth in Australia is one of the highest in the Western world, it's about 1.8, 1 1.9, 1 depending on the year. And a lot of it's been concentrated into Melbourne and Sydney. So problem they got themselves into is uh, the infrastructure is having trouble keeping up. A lot of complaints from people about the infrastructure. Uh, the banks, uh, there's, well, on the supply side, there's uh, constraints on the increasing the supply of land because of zoning. So that tends to restrict the, in relative terms, tends to restrict the supply. That tries to drive the price up. And on top of that, you've got Chinese money coming in. We're well aware of that in Canada. You've got it in Australia. Some of it is sort of capital flight from China. And uh, then you look at the vested interest. So now the unintended consequences of this. So what you find is that the people who are complaining bitterly are young people who find that they're priced out of the market. So they're becoming increasingly voluble. You find, on the other hand, the beneficiaries of this are people who are existing houses bought them years ago, have had huge capital gains. So, I mean, they want this to keep continuing. So keep the immigration rate up, you know, keep lending, so on. You find that the politicians like it because the headline on uh, GDP growth looks great in Australia. GDP per capita doesn't look so great, I might add, in Australia, but GDP growth looks great. The banks are happy because their collateral 
lending on mortgages, it looks really healthy. So they're very happy. So you find these coalitions then want to continue this process and they're very sensitive to any sort of downturn. So the unintended consequences is, this, is that what happens if some one of these effects starts to go wrong and you'll find that now there's pressure to decrease immigration rates. Now, if that happens, plus the Chinese government starts to squeeze the capital outflow, you're seeing that starting to happen now. On the other hand, in the Australian, you're seeing here in Canada, pressure to restrict you know, foreign investors in housing, restriction, that will tend to dampen it down. What they're trying to do is to reduce the increase in the house prices or to basically let them slowly drift down or in real terms, see that happen. But, you know, the, um, the gentle downturn could turn into something more significant and you could have a, a major downturn. So that's the in-house price. So that's what people worry about. And now you can see, you know, do you have as much control as you think you do as, as a government? Yeah. Right. Okay. It, it's, uh, it's, th there's a lot there. I want to unpack some of it. So I'm sure the, you will. <laughs> yeah. The, there's some interesting aspects. So for instance, that, I mean, it's maddening that, that we have restrictive zoning and land use restrictions that lead to inelastic housing supplies in the major cities of, you know, all of these countries. So, you know, San Francisco, Vancouver, Toronto, Sydney, Auckland, all, all have very similar situation with the restriction of the housing supply, which I want to distinguish that drives up rents that drives up rental rates and the cost of housing and so yeah. wh whereas something like having artificially low interest rates and lending you know really loose lending rules that would raise the cost of owning a home but not necessarily the the price paid by the renter and so that that one kind of puts people if, if you raise rental rates then you're raising the 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 value of the asset. And so you're not making people financially more risky, you know, the homeowners by doing that. But when you cause rental rates and home prices to diverge, home prices rise while rental rates stay the same or fall, which you get with the low interest rates, that's when you create this, uh, this r risk to the, uh, the mortgage holders. You, you mentioned also maturity mismatch, uh, which I think I should just uh, define for the audience. That's when, say, I have, say, I take out a short, a one-year loan and buy a ten, an asset that pays off in ten years. That might work out for me if I can continue to roll over that loan at a low interest rate e each of those ten years. But if the int short-term interest rate rises at any point, I could be insolvent and go bankrupt. Do you have any more to add to that on that line? Well, let me do the let me do the first one about the rental, right, and the house pricing mm -hmm. appreciation. I've seen some studies that suggest that there's a sort of rule of thumb in setting in a competitive market for rents is that uh, let's say that somebody bought an apartment and renting it out. So what they would do, let's say they leave her up and they they put in you know twenty percent equity and you've got eighty percent on a loan and then you rent it out. So you think of the cost of to you of, of renting. What are my costs, right? Well, first of all, there's the interest payment on the mortgage. Secondly, I've got maintenance. You know, when you rent out, there's always maintenance costs. And you also take into account capital gains or capital loss. Okay. So what they've seen, what they've observed, some people have observed, is that clearly the rents are factoring in significant capital gains. And that's people regard that as a bit of a danger sign. Because what they're saying is that the rentals and the people who are renting are taking that capital gain into, they're thinking that's sort of more as money in the hand. If the prices start to go down, there's capital losses. And then, of course, they start to get themselves into trouble because the rents are, you know, barely covering the, the interest payments. So then you start to get into problem with the cash flow of the person who actually owns the, uh, the apartment. So, you know, in terms, what you've got to think of is the equilibrium response in terms of the rents and the house price appreciation, et cetera. You've got to think of that as a package and how it all interacts. Now, your second one, just remind me, the second one was about... Uh, um, asset maturity uh, mismatch. Yeah, yeah. So, so in that case, coming back to the theory of banking, maturity mismatch, 
Traditionally, the story would be that there is a potential for a bank run. There's a paper by Diamond and Dibvig, classic paper in the early 80s, and there's been a whole literature spawned by that. And the story is very simple. It says that the bank can essentially invest in these illiquid assets, and it also can invest in liquid assets. Think of government securities. Now, the rate of return over a longer period is going to be higher than if you just rolled over the short-term liquid assets. What they do is they're borrowing short. Now, the thing is that they there are, the way the model's set up, it's a bit stylized. So you've got depositors fall into two groups. Ex ante, they don't know which one they're going to be. Some of them are going to, for some reason, are going to want to pull their money out the next period. And the others are going to find that, oh, no, I can leave the money in. So there's a there was a short term people who they don't know who they are. They know they know roughly the, the bank knows the proportions, but you know, individuals don't know, right? Now in that case, you get two Nash equilibria. So that what happens is that there are two equilibria. One is where the people short term essentially take their money and they've got liquid assets, bank's got liquid assets, the bank knows the proportions. And then what happens is that, you know, the, the long-term asset pays off and the long-term people get the return and everybody's happy. There's another ash equilibria where some of the long-term people start to run. And once some of them runs, they all want to run because they can be wind up. If you don't, you'll be at the end of the queue and you'll take a huge loss because there's a liquidation cost when you liquidate these long-term assets, like a fire sale. Now, there's all sorts of extensions to this model. You can put in the fact that the asset, the long-term asset's got some risks associated with it. You can introduce that the bank's not sure what the percentage of the people are, and there's all sorts of things. This is model, basic model is to justify deposit insurance. And you can also introduce capital ratios and sufficient equity. There are all sorts of games you can play with the model. That, that model has been used and extended in all sorts of ways. Then if you, you think about it, you realize you can generalize the idea. And so let me give you an example of a generalization of that model is that instead of dealing with depositors, you actually treat, treat these people the wholesale market. So that these people are, all that matters is that they, they do short term lending. It doesn't matter if they're a depositor or a wholesale, exactly the same model. So immediately that would tell you that when you created shadow banks, then you had the danger of a run because the wholesale people could run just like depositors. And that showed you the dangers. Now, before the crisis, people were theorists, dump theorists, who specialised, Gary Gorton was one, for example, was well aware of it. And so the structure of the shadow banks was set up to try to preempt that kind of run. So they would have structures so that the short-term losses the most extreme losses would be taken by the company, usually a bank, investment bank, they would take the first cut of the losses. So this was to more or less get people to understand that uh, they were standing behind it. The second thing is if there was a, was a liquidity event that they, the, the bank that basically set up this structure would then, it would actually buy up some of the short term debt. It would bring it back on its balance sheet. Now, the thing was, why were they doing this? One of the reasons was regulatory, because once you had this off-balance sheet, it didn't appear in their risks the way it used to run up until that time, and so therefore they didn't have to put capital aside for it. There's an even bigger twist on that, that in Canada there were so-called non-bank, uh, non-commercial, there were not non-bank uh, mortgage-backed securities. There was a number of companies involved in Canada. And they had a very particular so-called Canadian liquidity clause that said that if there was a general liquidity disruption in the market, then the provider would provide liquidity, they would buy it up. The two biggest uh, credit rating agencies, Standard Poor's and Moody's, would not accept this and said it was, it was uh, legally too loose. Canadian rating agency did rate it. There were some people saying that this was potentially dangerous, and it blew up. So the non-bank asset that commercial paper, there was a, a big blow up, and it had to be resolved and all the rest of it. So the thing is that the, the devils are in the details here. The regulators, OSFI, which is the bank regulator, it didn't fall under their remit. 
it fell under securities regulators because it seemed more security. So there was a sort of gap in the, in the regulatory system. This occurred also in the United States. You find that the investment banks did not fall under the FDIC, Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation. They basically regulated banks, traditional commercial banks. And the Security Exchange Commission really had not a lot of expertise in terms of credit and traditional banking. So one of the lessons that we learned after the crisis was a tightening up on the regulation of who was actually monitoring banks and also the shadow banks. Yeah, it, it seems problematic that uh, policy sort of created this incentive to take on more risk. And I I have some skepticism that any amount of regulation would be able to find and identify each source of risk given a strong enough incentive to seek them out on the part of the banks. So I want to uh, relate this to some of your other academic work. Uh, We've talked about mining and commodities markets and also housing. I I think these are examples of what you call in uh, another one of your papers, systemically important real sectors. Uh, could, Could you define what what those are and um, and how they relate to what we've talked about? Yeah, there's an old uh, tradition in banking. If you look back in the history, you go back into the 19th century and right through the 20th century was that shrewd commercial bankers had a kind of checklist of industries that could create real troubles for you lending. Real estate is obvious. We've seen many cycles in real estate across other many countries over time. But there are others like uh, railroads in the United States in the 19th and early 20th century. You get uh, telegraphy, examples of that in the 1920s. Car industry is another one. Uh, mining is a classic. I talked about oil and iron ore are classic examples. There are others like shipbuilding is another one. And so what are the characteristics? So when you go back, a lot of this is all verbal and it, you've got to read carefully and intelligently about what these bankers or bankers are saying. And in fact, uh, my co-author, John Crean, who was chief risk officer for Bank of Nova Scotia in here in Canada, he said his old bankers trained him. He was an academic, really, and then he got into banking. That he said, oh, no, the ones that you watch for are the following characteristics. High fixed costs. So, you know, in mining, it costs you a lot just to set up a mine. It costs you a lot to set up a car plant, for example you know, just the structure. So you've got high fixed cost, low marginal cost. If you look very carefully at these industries, they often have very low marginal cost. Next, you have a great degree of competition. And then finally, leverage. I'll come to leverage in a moment, uh, in the buying. So so here's how the mechanism works. It's really quite simple. And in this, uh, we're writing this monograph and we finished it and we have a simpler version of it, which will be, we're releasing it pretty soon in the next couple of months. But I've been teaching it a lot of this in as part of this program to integrate a lot of the risk management and systemic risk. So what you find is that consider a situation where the demand in this industry is just, you know, tootling along. It's a bit random, but it's certainly tootling out. And what's happening is that you find there's considerable capacity. People are adding capacity in a fairly predictable way. And then what happens is that there's a fall in demand. A good example would be uh, oil where you find that the world price for geopolitical reasons or whatever, fracking, for example, comes in, there's a low cost, different from ordinary drilling and so on. And so what happens is that the world price falls. Okay, Iron ore was another one. Demand came from outside, traditional sort of trade model. There's a collapse in the price. Now, what happens is that when that price goes down, it falls straight through to the bottom line. You will find that the industry... In many of these, like mining, you'll find that there are mines with different marginal costs. You'll find high-cost mines. In iron ore, for example, they would have uh, their iron ore. It was diff- more difficult to get out, so you have low marginal cost uh, mines. So what will happen is when the price goes down, then it depends on people's expectations of how long it will stay down. So let's take the – you're uncertain about this, whether it will bounce back up or it will stay down. So people have got to make estimates. Uh, of that, and then what will happen is that some of the mines will close their production. That doesn't mean they go out of totally out of business. They just put them on life support because if you really do close the mine down, there's a bond that uh, is out there to clean up the area and all the rest itself, and they just put them on life support, but they cut production. 
Now what happens? Your cash flow is gone. If you've borrowed, suddenly you've got cash flow problems and you can go bankrupt. So there's a cycle in mining of precisely this sort of thing. You'll see the same parallel in, uh, I mentioned earlier, in housing and particularly commercial real estate. You find the same sort of cycle. So they're the ones that you watch for. The other thing is in these particular industries is that banks, shrewd banks, more or less know this cycle. It's not made... It's often not made, you'll find in the literature, particularly in the, you know, the risk management literature, credit literature, it's often not made very precise. They often use indicators for industries, but the shrewd bankers take it into account and they understand that if you look at the data, we've looked back at data, you'll find that the losses here are essentially spasmodic. So you'll find high losses and then you will find nothing, 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 nothing. And then you might pass decades. Right. And that's what's so dangerous when you're using, uh, conventional credit models because they, they rely on fairly high frequency data and losses. Credit cards are a good example of that. But these industries, you can be suckered into believing that everything is fine. You get the spasmodic event and suddenly the losses appear out of nothing. So how do you deal with it? Chronometric models are tricky now because they tend to focus on the period that everything looks good. These can be quite extended. There are difficulties with the stationarity of the industry. It could be changing and morphing. Steel industry changed quite dramatically in terms of production over a few decades in the last few decades and so on. So you really do need more industrial organization knowledge of the industry to try to see what the downside is. Now, what's the probability of this downside? Good luck with that. Mm. What you do, this is where stress testing comes in. Effectively, what you do is you take the plausible worst case downside. And if you're trying to preserve the bank, and keep them safe, you do that stress test and make sure that you've got enough capital for that downside. Now, that's what the regulators and the banks are doing. We want to concentrate on some of these key areas. Do we get rid of all the risk? No, we don't pretend we can do that. But if we can just reduce the, the risk, it's very significant in terms of social benefits, right? Yeah. So um, I suppose a, a big part of this is how things propagate from the systemically important real sectors to the rest of the economy. So, you know, when you have a recession, it's not just in the in the one sector that uh, necessarily caused the recession, but it, it, seem, it seems like these financial institutions, you know, that, that the whole economy depends on for for credit and and intermediation services can be really sensitive to sudden unexpected shocks in the systemically important real sectors so talk talk through that that mechanism how how does it how does it come to affect uh, another relatively safer sector okay so so we actually set up the model and it the, the model I, uh, that I, we used, it's a standard general equilibrium model, and we assume that all the asset markets are complete and everything else. This is a straw man that we set up uh, to get ourselves going. So we actually show this very flexible model, and so everything is ex-ante Pareto optimal, right? So everything is fine. So if you get one of these downturns, what happens is that it's efficient, right? There is some shock, and it, it's efficient, and there's some losses. Now, the thing is that if people know that this is feasible, and they all agreed on the probabilities, the von Neumann Orchestern preferences, then, you know, they'll diversify. And even though there'll be losses, it would be spread around. Now, in the Medigliani Miller sort of Arata Brewer world, and this is, this is well known in the detailed banking theory literature, is that in that type of world, we don't need banks. We can do it all ourselves. So you really need, why do the banks really exist? And the answer is, there's asymmetries in information. They specialize. They're like wholesalers, and they have specific knowledge about following the credits. So they're called a delegated monitor. There's some theories on that delegated monitor. Now, we left that bit out. We're going to bring it back in later. So, so what happens is that to really understand what can go wrong, you have to ask yourself, what are the market failures? And you have to be very specific because the if you don't really understand that and you talk about symptoms, you won't really get at what the real problem is, and this is where the unintended consequences can happen. You essentially focus on the wrong thing, and you can actually create distortions that are actually worse. So 
let's take the case where you say it flows through to the rest of the system. Let me give you an example. Let's imagine there's a region, okay, I've take, let me take Australia. West Australia is iron ore. You can think of Alberta with oil. What happens is there's a downturn in the industry. Let's assume there's no bank lending for the moment. It's all equity. A good example of this would be uh, essentially the dot-com bubble imploding on Silicon Valley. There was very little lending in that area. It was nearly all equity, and the equity holders basically took the shot. Okay? So for the moment, let's think of an industry where there are equity holders. Let's assume the equity holders are widely diversified around the world. It's really like insurance. So they all take a bit of a haircut. They own small parts of it, and everything is fine. Now let's back off from that. Now let's start to look at cases where those losses are far more concentrated. And a good example of that would be in domestic real estate where people in that area own houses. They find their equity disappears. You'll find the jobs dry up. And so what you find is an increase in within a country in inequality because these people find that their standard of living goes down. Right? They've taken a big wealth loss. There's a book, there's a series of studies and then a book by Mayan and Sufi that actually they look at countywide data in the United States and that really shows this effect. So then the question comes, let's say there's some regional banks and they suffer big losses. Let's say that they haven't diversified, they've held all this real estate and lending in this industry and they go down. Texas banks, some of the Texas, well, Texas banks, smaller banks in, in the 1980s. Now what happens, you say that now I'm in a different part of the I'm in the same region, but a different economy. I export. I've had no problems. Wouldn't I have problem borrowing because now these banks are going being resolved? There's shortage of credit. The assumption here is is that about entry of other banks and financial institutions. So the real issue there is the degree of substitutability of other lenders to come in and fill the gap. So there are two issues. One is how fast those banks, particularly small ones, can be resolved quite quickly and how quickly they can basically do, you know, decent lending, and how quickly they can continue. And secondly, banks, how quickly they can come in from outside and do the lending to minimise the disruption on, for example, working capital or retailing or, or whatever these other industries are. So when you think about that, you have to ask yourself precisely where is the market failure? Uh, what can governments do to, in, to try to help eradicate it? and be very precise about it. Otherwise, you can have unintended consequences. Okay? Yeah, so it's it's interesting with the, with the in particular, home equity. In general, someone's house is their biggest investment. Uh, the value in their home is often they'll be counting on the value of their home for take the, to support them when they retire. And then it, it can be extremely... You can have a big downside, for instance, the, an example I've used before on this show is people in the, the Rust Belt, you know, if you have, a, you live in a smaller-ish town with a single major industry, if that industry goes away, I think the, the American furniture industry is an example where, where increased trade with China basically eliminated the whole industry. If you live in, lived in a town centered around one big furniture factory or a num even a few furniture factories, then not only do you lose your job, you also lose all the value in your home. And then, of course, having lost all the value in your home and with the very high rental and real estate prices in places where the there are more jobs, places like uh, San Francisco, you can't get up and move. Your labor mobility is uh, is heavily restricted. And so... It's sort of a, a bunch of bad things happening to you all at once, but also also bad things happening to to lenders if if there are any uh, if there are any banks that hold mortgages of of people in your region when that happens because they they may have been counting on each you know every, each individual mortgage in the Rust Belt being somewhat uncorrelated, but if they all default at once or all the all the ones in one town default at once that that could be systemically important well the the thing is that i think let's go back ex ante here um and, and just test some of the statements you're making first of all one of the dangers is to induce people through in the united states you have tax deductibility of interest payments that's not true in canada so you'll find that there's a big difference in canada 
that people tend to pay off their mortgages quicker than the United States because they don't get tax deductible of interest payments. And a lot of credit analysis come up from the US, come to Canada. They, they look at it and they don't understand that and they wonder why the people are paying it down faster. The other thing is it varies across states of the United States, but in Canada, essentially banks have recourse to other assets, whereas in some states of the United States, you know, essentially you can walk away from the house and they don't have any other recourse. Banks should know that. So, so what happens is, as my banker friends always tell me, we all know there's risks in lending of losses. That's normal. And the bigger the risk, the higher the compensation the price has got to be or the higher the interest rate to compensate. That's why with credit cards, you find that the people who are quite well off never borrow on their credit card. They roll it over at the end of the month. The people who borrow on their credit cards are kind of desperate. So you get, you get high loss rates, but that's why the rate's high, right? It's to compensate for the credit risk or much, much higher credit risk. So if you come back to the particular industry, and there's a, there's a wonderful example at the beginning of this book by Minus Sufi of a company that makes uh, mobile homes. You know, the sort of thing to see driving along the road, you know, like a Winnebago type thing. And they were hit. There was, uh, during the crisis, the demand for them fell quite dramatically. And that company laid off a lot of people. They got into a lot of trouble. And this was just a smaller town in the Midwest. And so there was a real problem. So the thing is, that if you were lending, why, first of all, why are you inducing people to, to own an own home, particularly when they don't, you know, their, their income is not high enough? Traditionally, those people would rent. And then the danger is to try to induce them into owning. So you find that, that in fact, historically, you'll find on the average, a very significant percentage of the population rent. Why? Well, they lose on the upside when the house price goes up and they've got equity when they're leaving. But equally, they don't lose on the downside. So what happens to their renting and the, basically the value of the real estate goes down, they don't see any losses. Probably the rents might go down a bit. So who, who loses? So you'll find in sort of a lot of rentals, you'll find companies that operate renting out and they spread the losses around amongst their equity holders and they'll spread the losses around across a lot of regions. So it's a, like a, it's a diversification effect. So, so the, the other thing you want to think about is that I'm unemployed. I'm in a Midwest town. The industry's gone away. What we really have to be concerned about is the training of those people, retraining of those people and how to make them more mobile. Let me give you an example. We found that the fishing industry contracted out on the east coast of uh, Canada, uh, the Atlantic provinces, and you find that quite a number of the people from, uh, we used to be fishermen, have moved, they moved west and worked in Alberta. So, you know, <laughs> you find they know it's, this may not last, so they laugh for a few years, they make out like bandits, and when the jobs go away, they just, they just ship back to the, the, the Atlantic provinces. Second example of that is in, in uh, Western Australia. The iron ore is back up on near the coast of Western Australia in really desert areas, and there are small little towns there that cope for the workers, but they fly in for two weeks, and then they fly back to Perth and their family. So they call fly-ins, fly-outs. So what happens is when the job goes away, they just move back down to, to Perth with their family. Now, the danger was they're making a awful lot of money and so if they were shrewd, what they would do is they would be very careful. They knew when this cycle went down, and the banks should know this as well, the regulators, that the house prices would go down in Perth. But these people are making an awful lot of money, and they should be squirreling it away. And they also should have some other skill set as well. So it's the, the real issue then becomes it's a distribution of income, but not just at a point of time, but over the lifetime. So what you worry about is that somebody's gone through this boom and then is stuck and they're gone for forever. You have to think, what is the policy failure? What is it the mobility problem? Is it a retraining problem? Those are the sort of issues that I would be concentrating on. Yeah. In the United States in particular, a lot of people when if if they're if you're forty or, you know, over forty and you're the industry you worked in for all of your career goes away. A lot of people will, rather than moving, rather than be retrained, and you know, retraining, you know, it's it's not easy to go from someone who spent twenty years in a furniture factory to, uh, you know, coding for Google or something like that. That's a very implausible career shift. But a lot of people will go on disability permanently until they are old enough to collect social security. So 
for some people, it's just a, a permanent exit from the labor force. And for in some in some small towns, that's a big chunk of the population living exclusively off of uh, government handouts, essentially, which can be very demoralizing and, and sort of a terrible outcome for, for a community. No, I understand. Mm-hmm. So what are you proposing? Yeah, I, I don't know. I, I suppose uh, part of it is that uh, is that disability and the, the way that system is structured is is not particularly is not particularly good with respect to incentives. And and part of it is is just the the uh, housing supply elasticity in in the major cities with growing industries tends to lock out people who are maybe credit constrained and lock them out from from the best labor markets, creating a, a large cost to uh, to the economy as a whole. So both of those so things I, could I be. I agree. So, sure. So so I think the thing is that you know, if you're thinking about what is a market failure, so you've got to think now that if you've put people on disability, you're paying them just to sit and you know watch television and then take drugs or something, which is a horrible outcome. So the thing is, if you take that income stream and say now he. We got that dollar for money. Is there something alternative we can do for them? And I think there's got to be some sense of hope that, you know, we can be employed in something constructive. So take the person who worked in a furniture factory. I mean, essentially, if they moved to an area where there was construction, you don't have to go just to, you know, San Francisco. There's, there are other communities where there are like construction. So, you know, if you're in a furniture factory, you would have skill sets, for example, in carpentry, in say, you know, kitchen. Production of uh, kitchen installations, things like that. Now, not a lot of that is. Some of that is is basically custom made, or it has to be modified. So you just can't import all the components. So they may have skill sets like that. You know, if somebody works in a furniture factory, they might be an accountant. They might be. There are a lot of skill sets that people have. They might be, you know, in terms of painting and have skill sets in those areas. So there's no one size fits all. I think the real role would be to try to help these people. And then also, you know, if you look at a lot of these cities, the costs are very high. You look at Toronto, for example. I mean, it's very expensive. And you can see companies, particularly smaller companies, uh, are asking themselves, look, I've got to pay pretty high salaries. The rents are really pretty high. And given the Internet and the way I can do my ordering online, I can interact with people and customers and all the rest of it, why don't I move to a smaller city where at the margins, the costs are low. Let me give you an example of that here in Kingston. I met a couple that just moved in the street from us, and they had, he and his friend were, pal was, were thinking of setting up a business somewhere or buying into a business, and they discovered Kingston. They bought into a business here, and they just, they had gone to paradise. The house prices are a lot lower. It's easy to get to work. You don't have all the hassle. And so you find some of these smaller cities are, you know, this is where the local government should be smart in trying to encourage it. You see this in Canada. You will see cities that are that are growing, and and also the social network is important. So in a lot of these, take the Midwest, the social support groups can start to fall apart at the same time as the, the informal ones. And I'm not going to the government ones, but the informal ones start to fall apart, and that becomes quite tragic. So I think one of the things would be to think about the social networks that through clubs or you know, school schools and and uh, churches and so on. They're quite important for people as support groups. I think that's something we should be thinking about. Yeah, it, it's sort of a mystery why why that hasn't ha- happened faster with businesses leaving the the cities that have the most uh, the highest rental and housing prices. Amazon is currently looking for a, a new headquarters, and I I believe I, I read something saying that they were they were taking housing and rental prices into into account when looking yeah. for where where to locate and one wonders why that hasn't happened on a bigger scale a lot of it might be just that you know their their network effects their positive gains from having a lot of talented people in one place and it's just really it, it's hard to coordinate getting them all to pick up and leave all at once and so there's still so there's some persistence to uh to having the benefits of being in one of these concentrated areas like Silicon Valley. Yeah, I think I think there's a, there's a sense in which you're right, and a sense in which I think uh, there's some industries which is not true. So Silicon Valley, my actually my son 
is in San, the younger son's in San Francisco, as an example. So the skill sets that he has, the major, you know, there's, two, there's a really a couple of major places. One is Boston, and the other one is Silicon Valley, and there are a couple of smaller ones. We've discussed this. So you find that there is some economies of scale of this network effect, and it's, you know, you start to see some of them down the south around Virginia, you're starting to see them uh, set up. But there's, there's a hurdle, you know, um, who's going to start up there and the others going to join? So there's a coordination problem of, of where you're going to set up. But that's not true for quite a lot of other industries, which are smaller, uh, more fragmented. They don't actually need that type of concentration. You find uh, also in the United States, you see it here in Canada too, that university towns are a bit of a magnet. So you'll find that you'll you'll find associated with these university towns. I'm thinking of Waterloo, for example. Silicon Valley is really based around Stanford and and to some extent Berkeley, and that's and then in Boston you've basically got MIT and then associated universities. So in that sort of high tech area, where you need highly trained engineers, IT people, etc. They tend to cluster around very good universities. But that wouldn't be true in, say, you know, you're constructing construction, say, kitchens. I'm just using that as an example. I'm just using it. You don't really need that. So what they need is uh, the economies of scale of moving in that industry and that network effect is not as large. Small-scale manufacturing is another one. The transport costs, whether they're traveling, depends where their market is, whether it's in Toronto, whether it's in Kingston or Belleville or something like that, it doesn't matter an awful lot. So you're finding, I think these smaller cities could uh, look for these types of industries because they don't have this. They all, of course, they all want to be the second Silicon Valley. I think that's kind of silly because most of them just all they end up with subsidizing, losing their money. So I think you've got to think very carefully about the types of industries and the structures. And also the infrastructure, the kind of training backup that you've got. I think well, I think that comes as a package. So we're we're coming to the end of our time. Do you have any closing thoughts? What, what would you say is the main takeaway that someone should should take from this conversation we've had? All right, let me summarize. Go back to the beginning about unintended consequences. What I've tried to do in many of these examples we've been talking about are. Try to understand what the problem is. And I mean that at a deep level. I don't mean at a superficial level. What is the problem? Exactly the problem. You must define the problem very carefully. You have to understand why the problem is a problem and identify it. Then you have to think very carefully, what is the appropriate policy that you, you know, want to apply? Now, this is always risky. Whatever you do, it's risky. So because you never have complete information, you never have complete control, because once you start one of these interventions, you must be cold-blooded enough to understand that government agencies will not operate as efficiently as you might like. think you should take this into account. Let me give you a good example of that would be defense procurement, which I know a bit about. You'll find that, you know, we're going to buy an aircraft, very expensive. You'll find that the people are selling you will tell you it flies, it dances, it does everything, and it's going to cost a nickel and a dime. You know, that's just sales. What you have to really understand is that these are very long-lived assets, and it's not just the sticker price, but it's also the maintenance cost. So defense procurement is a very sophisticated activity, and you must think through the consequences. You must also think very carefully at what happens the deal falls through. What in the contract? What are the prop out clauses? What happens if this aircraft is not, I'm thinking of the F-35. Um, what happens if it doesn't really work? Have we got an out? We just throw money away. What's our second best alternative? Does it matter if we've delayed and so on? So I'm really asking for very careful analysis, very cold blooded, avoid being stampeded into policies, um, by the media, by, uh, fads, passing fads. I've seen many examples of this. It applies not just to government policy, but it also applies within corporations themselves. So, and also, when you've gone through that and you have failures, inevitably, these are risky and there will be failures, analyze them cold-bloodedly. Do not sweep them under the carpet. Do not try to paper over it, but learn from it. So you really need to do, as one of my banking friends tells me, do a forensic. What went wrong? What could we learn from it? 
and use that to train people so that they know where the bodies are buried. There's always going to be risks. There's always going to be surprises. Just try to improve the system so that when you look at it in ex ante sense, we've got a benefit. Okay, that's very important. That's the takeaway message. Mm -hmm. My guest today has been Frank Milne. Frank, thanks for being part of Economics Detective Radio. Thank you, Eric. Been a pleasure. If you enjoyed this episode of Economics Detective Radio, be sure to subscribe in your favorite podcast app. If you really enjoy Economics Detective Radio, if you've been listening for a while, I encourage you to help support the podcast through Patreon. We've had a lot of people sign up to do that in the last little while. We've had Michael, Christoph, Alex, Sean, Stephen, quite a few pledges. I don't know why they all came at once. Maybe it's just uh, just lucky. Maybe the content's been particularly good lately. But thanks to all of you who have pledged to help the show uh, every little bit really helps, and it's a big encouragement to me to make more episodes and, and do the work of finding guests every week. So thank you so much for that, and I'll be back next week. Next week.